Hello, my name is Ross Stevens, and today I'll be talking about dysfunctional voiding and characterizing the pressure flow rate patterns and prevalence of bowel and sexual symptoms in this patient cohort. I was part of a team including Sachin Malde, Claire Taylor, Aaron Sahai, and Eskinder Solomon. I have no affiliations to declare for this presentation. And during this presentation, I'll give a brief introduction to dysfunctional voiding, talk about the methods and results of our retrospective study, and summarize with some take home messages. So the ICS defines dysfunctional voiding as an intermittent or fluctuating flow due to inadequate or variable relaxation, generally of the external sphincter during voiding in neurologically normal men. Our experience is that patients identified with a flow limiting region at the external sphincter during voiding on video urodynamics often doesn't meet this pressure flow characteristic. So we wanted to investigate this further. In literature, between 14 and 43% of men under the age of 50 can be diagnosed with dysfunctional voiding depending on the patient population being studied. In our tertiary referral center, from 103 consecutive neurologically normal men investigated with video urodynamics and diagnosed with voiding dysfunction, 40% were diagnosed with dysfunctional voiding. So we have collated a patient population of 53 men aged between 23 and 50 years old, all diagnosed with dysfunctional voiding following video urodynamics and all had nothing adverse disclosed on brain and spine MRIs and flexible cystoscopy. So global pelvic floor dysfunction can not only result in urinary symptoms, but bowel and sexual symptoms as well. In terms of erectile dysfunction, spasm of pelvic floor muscles can provide extrinsic compression that restricts the lumen of the internal pudendal artery and thereby limits internal pudendal arterial inflow preventing a man from sustaining an erection. Also, corporal veno-occlusive function retains blood in the penis during an erection. This is dependent on sustained corporal smooth muscle relaxation. In terms of defecation, pelvic floor relaxation is required to straighten the anal rectal angle from 90 to 125 degrees and relax anal sphincter muscles. We asked 26 of our 53 patients if they had bowel or erectile dysfunction symptoms, 6 had bowel dysfunction alone, 5 had bowel and erectile dysfunction, and 4 only had erectile dysfunction symptoms. In terms of lower urinary tract symptoms, 25 patients presented only with voiding LUTs, 20 had voiding and storage LUTs, and eight only had storage LUTs at initial presentation. So we wanted to categorize these patients into three different groups. The first group, called the intermittent flow group, matches the ICS definition, and 20 of our 53 patients had an intermittent flow due to variable relaxation of the external sphincter during voiding, resulting in isovolumetric detrusive contractions. The second group was a high pressure low flow group with a bladder outlet obstruction index of above 20. These patients had a prolonged flow and 19 of the 53 patients fit into this category. This particular patient had a PDA at Qmax of 49 centimeters of water, generating a maximum flow of seven milliliters per second resulting in a bladder outlet obstruction index of 35. And as you can see from the image, their flow limiting region was at the external sphincter. The last group was a low pressure, low flow group with a bladder outlet obstruction index of less or equal to 20. 14 of the 53 patients fit into this category and these patients also had a prolonged flow rate. This patient in particular had a PDA at Qmax of 40 centimetres of water with a Qmax of 15 millilitres per second, resulting in a bladder outlet obstruction index of 10. As you can see from the image, 
they still have a flow limiting region at the external sphincter during voiding. So how can this change management? So of our group of 53 patients, 33 had a prolonged flow rate and did not fit the ICS definition of dysfunctional voiding. This means that if they were investigated with normal urodynamics, not using fluoroscopic imaging, they may have been misdiagnosed as having bladder neck obstruction, resulting in an inappropriate bladder neck incision surgery. Also, if we can identify which patients have global pelvic floor dysfunction, this cohort might get better symptom improvement from pelvic floor physiotherapy. If we can identify patients with isolated external urethral sphincter dysfunction, sphincteric Botox might be more appropriate in this cohort. And also, it would be good to investigate whether global pelvic floor dysfunction or isolated urethral sphincter dysfunction is a prognostic factor for sacral neuromodulation. Thank you for listening to my talk. These are my references, and I hope you enjoy the rest of ICS 2021 online.